together now. This is Eleanor Lacane. The coronavirus is resurging with a vengeance. We've now hit a new record high of 3,000 people a day dying of COVID-19 in the United States. That's about the number of people we lost in the 9-11 attacks on one day. Now it's happening every day. So how can we keep safe? here to talk with us about what we can do to strengthen our immunization, our own immune systems naturally is our guest, Jim Turner, a partner in the DC law firm of Swankin and Turner founded in 1973. Jim represents businesses, individuals, and consumer groups in a wide variety of drug health, environmental and product safety regulatory matters. He was one of the first lawyers working with Ralph Nader in the Nader's Raiders and wrote The Chemical Feast, the Nader Report on Food Protection. Jim is board chair of Citizens for Health, advocating for consumer rights to natural healing. So he has many other great projects, but I'm going to, since he's here with us, invite him back. Welcome back to All Together Now, Jim. Thanks, Eleanor. I'm glad to be here. So I know you've been tracking this coronavirus very carefully, and you've got really decades of experience around natural health and what people can do to protect themselves. What would be your advice for people? What can they do to strengthen their immune system naturally? Yeah, well, well first of all, I'm very cautious about giving advice. Uh, I, uh, I, can, I can say things that I've heard people say that they, they do, that they find useful. Uh, and I, I think people should uh, you know, work hard to find out for themselves what they can find. But uh, one thing that's very clear, uh, I, I had a couple of things I wanted to say at the outset. One is that uh, it is a, this, this coronavirus uh, situation, uh, Corona-19 is very serious. Uh, it's not something you want to have to encounter or get involved with or in any way, um, you know, stay away from as much as you can and also uh, build the natural immune system that you were talking about. <clears throat> and um, the first thing is um, we believe very strongly at Citizens for Health in the right of the individual consumer to choose. And so we want to have as much information available for choice as we can. Uh, and keep in mind that you're in charge of your own health. Now, saying that, uh, the data that I've been seeing, 75% uh, of the people who are uh, uh, having a very hard time and dying from coronavirus have some kind of underlying health problem originally, uh, in particular, um, health, uh, heart disease, hypertension, and so forth. These are uh, all matters that you should be very clear with your own in your own health and uh, and medical framework uh, where you stand on all of these potential underlying problems hypertension heart disease and so on um, note very very carefully when you see something such as the um, the British uh, government statement about uh, people who are uh, highly allergic should avoid the uh, Pfizer uh, shot uh, mm -hmm. so just just be aware of that. You want to know those kind of things. Um, so, no, are you highly allergic? Uh, and probably you want to know if you're moderately allergic. Again, this is something you want to deal with your healthcare professionals about. There's a lot of um, interesting data emerging about the value of uh, good nutrition. Uh, mm -hmm. Vitamin C and D have been very, uh, very widely circulated, and there are programs that can tell you how to get a daily uh, vitamin C and D uh, dose that will keep you um, uh, strong, build your immunity. 
uh, one of the most, and he, uh, by the way, just let me keep going and then I'll say mm -hmm. my point is to make. Yep. Uh, you, you can have, um, you, must, you should get outside and walk around uh, a bit. Uh, I uh, would say that if you have mask rules in your area, follow them. Uh, my basic premise is uh, uh, unless there is a reason not to follow the rules that are being promulgated, that these are personal decisions we're talking about now. They're, they're different from the public policy decisions. If someone's made a public policy decision that in your area at this time, you should wear a mask, uh, be very careful uh, not to resist that. Uh, and there, there are a couple of reasons for that I wanna add. One is mm -hmm. uh, it could resisting could expose you to problems. But secondly, uh, you probably wanna save your resistance for ensuring that you have a right to choice when the vaccine comes your way. And uh, so that's a very important part of the activity here. Um, uh, the, the activity of getting outside is very important. Uh, it's also important to organize uh, your connections with other people. Um, it is interesting that uh, while we are uh, uh, blocked sig significantly from physical interpersonal uh, connections, we have actually a much more robust way of getting together on things like uh, Zoom here that we're doing now. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's uh, very clear from the data that uh, being isolated is a, is a serious problem. In fact, there's an article in the New York Times today uh, calling the mental health problems with COVID uh, being the fourth wave of what's happening. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, now what I was going to say, the generic point is that all the things that you do to maintain your immune system and your health in general uh, in the framework of COVID are things uh, that uh, would be valuable to do without COVID. Uh, in other words, you know, get outside, get around, do exercise. I didn't mention that, but exercise is important, even if you have to do it inside, you know, on a, on a walker or bike or whatever. If you ride a bike around uh, in the um, outside, uh, that's good. Uh, but you want to get out in the air uh, and um, and uh, you also want to, you know, avoid unnecessary contacts uh, physically, but build as many contacts as you can uh, through the inter uh, through the media and so on. So that's kind of a, a very quick sketch. Uh, we do have from time to time things at the Citizens for Health uh, website, citizens.org. Uh, we have a number of things that are on ongoing there. Uh, they tend to be more in the area of policy, but there are things there that might be useful. And there are a lot of other good uh, sites. You just uh, check out, uh, you know, COVID natural healing and see what you find. Yeah, that sounds great. And like you say, all of those things you're recommending are good to do whether or not there's COVID. So um, this idea of walking outside, biking outside, exercising, there's scientific evidence showing when you exercise, you strengthen your immune system, right? Absolutely, and uh, and 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 it is it's it's, it's interesting. Let, let me give you the, the the overview of COVID that I've heard best was uh, somebody said it's Mother Nature telling you to go to your room and reflect on your behavior. <laughs> so, um, if you think think about what your life was like uh, when you were in the in the rat race, and then think about all the things you now have an opportunity to do that you probably either should have been, you know, probably thought you should have been doing uh, and probably even said, hey, I will do that. I will get some exercise. I will get out and take a walk. I will do these things. But in the rat race, it was very tough. It's now uh, a little easier. Uh, you know, you're mm -hmm. not walking with the mask. That's, uh, you know, you're not contacting folks, but you are getting out there. You're doing some exercise, getting some fresh air. And then uh, you also can look at, you know, take some time and look into your nutrition, see what you, see what you got. See if you can find out how to get into a, a good vitamin C and D uh, program, a daily program. Uh, these are all things that, um, uh, you know, many, many people, particularly here in Washington, that's where we are, uh, mm -hmm. who get in that rat race, keep saying they should do and never do, you know, mm -hmm. this, 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 this slips away from them. And then just think of all the wonderful deadly dinners that you can miss now because the restaurants are all closed. <laughs> Right, exactly. So there you go. You see, there's a bright side to everything. Always a silver lining in every cloud. And right. it's interesting. I've heard that said before about COVID-19 is Mother Nature's way of sending us to our room to reflect on what we're doing. They've always said it in the context of the way we're polluting and using up nature's resources. And a lot of that is slowed down 
people are driving their cars less, polluting less, uh, and just quieter, like go inside and be more reflective for your own uh, life. Uh, but I have never heard anyone say that in terms of here's your chance to reflect on your uh, your behavior in terms of your own health, in terms yeah. of make sure you exercise every day a couple of times if you can and um, and eat well, look at what you're eating, stay away from the junk food and the food products. So I know uh, I, you're, you're a neighbor as well as a professional friend and colleague and we go across the street to a park um, my husband and I walk three times a day. It's a mile around the park. So we go out. Very good. Yeah. Breakfast, lunch, before dinner, boom. Yeah. Just get it. And if we get busy, we might miss one, but then we know we've got two walks in for the day. So, uh, and it's really felt fantastic to do that. Yeah. And, and actually, you know, what's interesting is if you go outside here in our neighborhood and look, the air is a lot cleaner. I mean, I, you know, I've, I've seen things in the sky that I've never seen before, like, you know, blue. <laughs> <laughs> right. And we're missing that uh, smog and pollution, which right. is so great to have that gone. So uh, what a great time to kind of rethink our own personal behavior in terms of our own health yep. and taking charge of our health, which I know is kind of a big theme in your life. I'm concerned that I see so many people out there and they're terrified of COVID. They're looking at this 3,000 people a day dying. They see the numbers, you know, millions of people have it. The chance of contagion and catching it is, you know, going up exponentially. Uh, but instead, and yes, we should rightly be concerned about it and be aware of it. But I think knowing that there are some specific things we can do to strengthen our own immunity really helps kind of us claim our own power back so we don't feel like we're a victim of this deadly disease coming out to get us but rather there's things we can have agency we can take action we can do things that limit our exposure and increase our ability to fight the COVID off if it does come our way yes and I believe it's important for everybody to do kind of a uh, personal health audit hmm. and actually find out which category you're in. If you're a person with hypertension, you've got to take more precautions um, you know, with regard. If you're a person, uh, uh, I think three quarters of the people who have died from COVID have been uh, above the uh, age of 65. Um, so you need to be aware that you may need to take some special uh, uh, special actions in that, uh, in that situation. Uh, if you're over 65 and have hypertension, then you're much more vulnerable, apparently. Now understand, I, I said apparently there, mm -hmm. understand the next thing that's most important about, uh, about COVID-19 to me is uh, we don't know much about it. Uh, we have mm -hmm. all kinds of information running around, but it's all almost all data points. We don't have a clear picture of what it is, where it came from, what it means. Um, we have, um, uh, we, we need to know more. Uh, uh, there, it, there's a whole lot of debate as to whether uh, if we had not, if we had done some of the things I'm talking about in say January or February and uh, thought more carefully about the sets of people who were vulnerable and then put a more cohesive, clear plan into place, we might have been able to uh, target our responses in a way that uh, created more safe spaces for people who are more vulnerable. Uh, we, the, the idea that everybody's at the same risk is a, a complicated idea because younger people are not having the same kind of immediate responses. That's important to know. Simultaneously, we don't know what the long-term effects are. And uh, we don't really know that much about this uh, agent or whatever it is that's causing this. We, we don't know that much about it and we're working hard on it. And I you know today's a big day because this is the, I think right this minute, the FDA committee reviewing uh, the new vaccine is actually meeting. They, uh, uh, as I uh, understand it, uh, they began meeting at 11 o'clock this morning. I have been watching the news to see, I thought maybe we would announce it on your program, but I haven't seen anything about what their recommendation is at this point. But uh, this is a very tough situation. This is a very rapid uh, development of a vaccine. And uh, it's uh, going to be a very complicated uh, rollout to get it to people. 
uh, and it's not been thoroughly tested as other vaccines are. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I heard the uh, commissioner, a former commissioner of the FDA the other day saying that uh, a lot of the information that we need to know about how well it works and with whom and so forth, we will learn from the post-marketing surveys. Uh, now they're pretty confident that it's safe. Although, as I say, the British came out and said, if you uh, have uh, strong allergies, avoid the shot. So that's another thing you want to really work on. Mm -hmm. um, that was just yesterday. Uh, but um, uh, the notion of exactly how it's going to work and so forth is still unrefined. So we're, we're learning, we're learning as we go. Right. Well, I want to talk to you about the uh, vaccines and then we can circle back to some more uh, and kind of natural approaches we can take uh, we haven't discussed yet. But the vaccines is really hot right now. It's it now there's actually three vaccines, as I understand it. And one of them, the first one out of the gate was Pfizer, which I guess is the one where you have to keep it in this really cold storage and refrigeration and you need to have two shots spaced out for to, to get the maximum effectiveness. But um, there's a lot of concern that this big rush to market has really short changed the careful assessment that the FDA is generally known for doing. Um, but here we have Pfizer and then within a couple of weeks, there were two other companies that said, yeah, we have a vaccine and ours is 90% effective too. So um, what do you think about uh, the fact that these vaccines, of course, we want to do whatever we can scientifically to help people get and stay healthy, but um, are you concerned about this rush to market jeopardizing the safety of these vaccines? Well, uh... The rush to market is taking bigger risks than we ordinarily take. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I want to emphasize uh, at the point I was making earlier, and it's the core, basically the core point of the Citizen for Health approach, which is each individual's health is in their hands, mm -hmm. and they have to make the decisions for themselves. So uh, looking at the vaccine from the standpoint of the individual who wants to, who's, who's there who will ultimately be the one that receives the vaccination, um, you need to, uh, I, I think it's important to make the decision on the basis of all the information you have at the time that it's there for you to make. And so understand that basically the vaccine that's going to be shipped out, they're, they're hoping that it's approved today and then shipped out tomorrow. They've got uh, FedEx trucks and UPS trucks lined up uh, there. They're, the FedEx is, I think, taking the west of the Mississippi, and uh, and uh, UPS is taking east of the Mississippi. Uh, they're going to pick everything up in Indianapolis, I think it is, where the manufacturing plant is, uh, and they're going to spread it out across the country. They'll they'll take the what they're going to do is take it by truck to the hubs of those two uh, delivery systems, and then the hubs will fly it uh, to every center part of the uh, country. But understand that they're only going to be putting out about twenty thousand doses. Uh, and then the question is who uh, gets those 20,000 doses? And the, uh, the, the, the policy position right now is uh, something, uh, some kind of balance between uh, nursing home residents and first responders. So the average individual who's out there uh, coping with daily life is not yet in a position where they have to make a decision, should I, should I not get the vaccination? Um, now, um, uh, uh, for those who are in the nursing homes and those who are first uh, first responders, you know, the emergency people, those folks will need to be making a decision and they'll need to look into all of the questions about uh, how rapidly it was done or whatever. And, you know, most of the, most of the medical people will probably be very comfortable. Uh, and uh, I, I certainly think that it's uh, not, it's not, it's certainly reasonable to uh, push the vaccine out there and let people have that choice. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, the there are there are a lot of serious problems involved in this in this program. Um, uh, uh, even uh, even the uh, president-elect Biden's, uh, who has what may be the most ambitious announced program, uh, is only is saying in the first hundred days he would like to be able to inoculate 100 million people. 
uh, that's, or he has 100 million, he's at 100 million doses was the way it was said. My impression was that was 100 million people. Uh, although, uh, as you point out, the Pfizer uh, vaccine requires two doses, 21 days apart. So uh, mm -hmm. that's a huge, uh, a huge uh, logistical task. I mean, just that, and, and if we were to be successful, 100,000 doses means only 50,000 people. And uh, that's uh, very, that's 5% that's, uh, of the 100 million that uh, uh, President-elect uh, Biden would like to do in the first 100 days. I, I'm saying all this just to give a feel for what the magnitude mm -hmm. of the task is. And, uh, and then, you know, the idea of that you're going to have uh, 50,000 or 100,000 people now and maybe 100 million people later who come in one time and then have to come back 21 day to days later in order to get the full impact of the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Remember, the vaccine's impact is not only on the individual, but it's on the whole community. Uh, when they were doing the trial, a uh, significant number of people, we don't know how many because the trial information is not that, not that public, but a significant number of people had reactions to the first shot uh, and didn't take the second shot. So, so that raises you know, some questions about what will happen when you put large numbers of people out there. Uh, I um, was involved in uh, vaccine policy activity uh, at the request of the former Secretary of uh, Health and Human Services, John Gardner, back in 1970 to 80. And right in the middle of our activity, the uh, 1976 swine flu event occurred. And they began to inoculate 200 million people at that point. But uh, when they got to 49 million, they stopped because so many people were having serious side effects. Uh, so Th we this was of which vaccine? A flu. This is a flu, flu shot. Mm -hmm. Fine flu vaccine, 1976. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, <clears throat> the, the problem, I mean, the issue that we're doing, this is a hugely complex task mm -hmm. uh, to start from scratch, go through all of the manufacturing, the testing, uh, the uh, validating uh, both the safety and efficacy of the vaccine, and then getting it through the regulatory process and then getting it out distributed uh, and to, uh, you know, in this case, you know, it will be 20,000 people will have to get, uh, if they're going to do 20,000 people, they'll have to get 40,000 doses out there. That is 20,000 doses out there twice. They have to be held in extreme uh, uh, freezing temperature. Uh, this is a very complicated task. And, uh, and I'm, I'm very nervous about this kind of a task. I mean, uh, this kind of, this system is the one that brought us the opioid crisis, uh, brought us way, uh, way too much reliance on antibiotics. Uh, it's uh, created uh, in, in the FDA process a very significant number. Uh, the GAO at one point said, uh, General Accounting Office, General Accountancy Office said that 50% um, of all of the new uses approved for drugs uh, by the FDA are withdrawn within five years. Uh, so uh, generally speaking on a new drug, I, I would, I, if, it, if at all possible, take five years of its marketing before using it. Not, not, not very sensible or usable for a vaccine uh, in a situation like this. Still, uh, given that it's going to roll out, uh, you might want to make a real high priority of looking at what you can find out about the rollout, you know, any individual. And uh, that's why, you know, talk to your doctor. There are lots of doctors who are watching it carefully. They're getting information. Uh, this, is a big, this is a big deal. This is a, a meaningful event. Uh, and it's, it's going to uh, get us, we're going to learn enormous amounts about all of our systems as we do this. Right, exactly. Well, you know, the pharmaceutical companies have a very mixed record, as you well know. And some of the drugs they've created have been life-saving, life-changing, fantastic, um, really wonderful contributions to modern life. And some of their... Uh, drugs have been terrible. Um, they've been dangerous, addictive, and deadly, like you mentioned, the opioid crisis, to, to the point where, you know, the average person looks at this and go, how much of this is really good for me? And how much of it is the pharmaceutical company is trying to make money off of this. And of course, their business, they're going to want to make money. But with the opioid crisis, we saw they were pushing the drugs on people, whether they needed them or not, to make them addicted so they would sell 
more uh, opioid drugs. So that kind of behavior really, I think, gave a big black eye to the pharmaceutical industry to the point where now we have 50% of Americans in a survey show they're reluctant to take a vaccine because they don't really trust that it is safe. And for, well, go ahead. Yeah, well, well, let's go just start with that 50% and just say, you know, some percentage of that 50% has made a calculated decision that this thing is not working for them. It's not a good thing for them. So we, mm -hmm. we need to be clear that it isn't all suspicion of the drug industry. Some people are very uh, attuned to looking up information and saying, I don't think this is the right way to proceed. <clears throat> just take, for example, if you happen to be extremely uh, allergic. <laughs> right mm -hmm. now, an extremely allergic person would say, I ain't gonna take that vaccine. I mean, that would be, would be a mistake to do it. Uh, but I want to go back uh, and talk about uh, the pharmaceutical approach. Um, you know, it's it's funny, uh, you know, from our conversations that I, I tend to think that if you put something on a spectrum that goes from good to bad or left to right, you, you, you um, confine yourself to a narrow view of the issue. So mm -hmm. in, let's just take opioids as an example or an, you know, antibiotics. Uh, both opioids and antibiotics are very, very positive, very useful, very powerful interventions uh, when used properly. And uh, the biggest problem we have is imbalance. So um, uh, uh, for example, as an individual, uh, you wanna really re try to restrict your reliance on antibiotics to when they're, it's very important as an intervention. So maybe when the temp your own body temperature is up to 102, 103, maybe or your kids are, maybe then you do an antibiotic. But to go in and do an antibiotic every time you have a little fever, which is one of the habits we've gotten into, you not only uh, undermine your own health, but you create a serious problem such that right now the United Nations, uh, you know, in the last couple of years has declared a, uh, a antibiotic uh, emergency worldwide over use of antibiotics. In the opioid case, it's interesting for Citizens for Health, we had our first opioid in, uh, involvements when doctors who were uh, uh, prescribing opioids for patients who are in extreme pain uh, and to us, it looked like reasonably prescribing the opioids were being targeted by law enforcement and put out of business. And we were saying, wait a minute, um, people have a right to choose uh, something uh, and, and opioids are very effective in pain reduction, um, but they then, the company starting in the nineties basically, uh, really pushed, pulled out all the stops, and got advised by McKinsey and company who just apologized for this uh, and, and really pulled all the stops out to uh, sell as much of the opioids as they possibly could mm -hmm. and created this huge national disaster. Uh, it's the imbalance of the use of the opioids that was the problem there. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you work with the, these companies, I've worked with the, both food and drug companies uh, from the consumer point of view, we're saying you got to take the consumer interest into heart in order to market effectively. And you work with them and you see internally in these companies, there's a continuous battle between the quality control scientific side and the marketing side. And the marketing side wants to do everything it can to make money as quickly as it can. And the, and the science guys are saying, but wait a minute, this, you know, in the long run, if this comes back to bite you, you could actually undermine your bottom line. That is an internal battle in these companies, which mm -hmm. is constantly going uh, ongoing. Um, FDA, by the way, doesn't actually get involved in any of that until after the company resolves its internal concerns and then turns its information over to the FDA for the FDA to review its science and what it's done, what its uh, selling programs are going to be and so on. So the FDA is always reviewing work done by the companies after the, after it's, after the companies have gone through all of this. All this business you've been reading in the paper about 93% effective and so forth is all company PR. It's all press releases put out by the companies. It hasn't been confirmed yet. It's not been confirmed and we you know, have no idea what it means actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I, I appreciate that about you, Jim, is that you stand solidly with the, vi the science in it and you don't say I'm for vaccines or I'm against vaccines like I'm for the science and what does the science show us about this vaccine for this person at this time under these conditions and that it's up to the consumers that it shouldn't be forced upon people to take it and particularly with all the uh, all the variables right now I think it would be dangerous to 
mandate and force everybody to take it. They also have a practical problem now that apparently President Trump was given the opportunity to buy more doses of the Pfizer vaccine back in June, and he refused to do it. So Pfizer now has gone to other countries like Canada, England, the European Union, and is selling it there. So we're actually going to have a fairly limited number of doses out of the Pfizer vaccine, given the need in the country. Is that right? Well, that's that's uh, those facts are correct, and what that means is, uh, you know, that that's we're, we're going to live with that. Uh, in my uh, own sense, uh, personally, is that uh, that ups the ante for every individual to mm -hmm. learn what all the options are. Uh, there are over a hundred uh, modalities that are out there that uh, do not rely on pharmaceuticals, surgery, or radiation uh, for everything. Uh, and every one of them uh, is stepping up with the way that they can relate to uh, the COVID virus uh, or COVID-19. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, you know, even things as um, uh, far removed from what we're talking about as massage therapy would argue that they help the immune system. Uh, but Qigong, acupuncture, uh, homeopathy, um, uh, various kinds of uh, energy healings, all of them, and dietary supplements, of course, all of them are saying, they have a way to contribute to um, at least minimizing the symptoms of uh, the COVID-19. And I, I want to emphasize, I would not ever uh, argue that you rely on one of them. Uh, that, that isn't uh, the way to you know, resolve this kind of a situation. What you need to do is organize your own program for yourself, uh, which includes all the things we talked about before. And then and then look into these others and see what kinds of things they, pro they provide and what information there is. There's science out there for a lot of these things. Uh, take a look and see what's there. Um, now, you know, you can't necessarily do that all by yourself as an individual, but it's probably wise to have a, a good uh, health advisor in, or more, more than one, in your, uh, in your network. Uh, call your doctor, call your internist, call your MD. Uh, call your uh, the, your uh, integrative medicine person. Look at the stuff. It's uh, the National Institute of Health has a uh, office on uh, complementary and integrative health. Uh, go over there and check out that information, and uh, build uh, a personal um, program for yourself and your family and your friends, and talk to your friends and have them do it. Um, There's a real opportunity to figure out how we can. Um, help uh, provide protection for ourselves and our communities, our families, our friends, people across the country and start a dynamic going where we actually take responsibility for our health and understand uh, uh, whatever the situation is about uh, the, the pros and cons of vaccination, there aren't gonna be very much out there at the initially uh, if, if Biden who has the most ambitious program is fully effective and everything works he still leaves two two thirds of the population unvaccinated in the first hundred days. Yeah, two thirds of the American population. Yeah. So, uh, but at least we'll be on a track. I mean, it's been so deeply concerning to me that the leadership in this country has known about the COVID nineteen uh, disease pandemic since. January. Well, no. actually, it's, it's actually worse than that. Uh, we've known about COVID for the, the first COVID started emerging in 1937, and we know a lot about them. One of the things that we know about them is that they're hard to know things about. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but as, 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 as early as the, as, as the 2000s, early 2000s, uh, we were working on uh, uh, information. In fact, uh, in fact, over the last 10 years, there have been uh, three different kinds of potential pandemic outbreaks mm -hmm. uh, in the US, uh, Ebola and H1N1 and um, MRSA. And these all were managed in a way that while they did cause serious problems, uh, not you know to the individuals that had them and to the groups that had them, they did not break out into this kind of massive ex uh, experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, just one of the things that troubled me enormously is that uh, out of the Ebola situation uh, in 2015, uh, the White House created a, uh, an Office of Pandemic Management, essentially, it's not quite its name, but 
they were ma monitoring all kinds of band pandemic in, uh, uh, suggestions, uh, you know, in, in pieces of information um, uh, in the White House, in the National Security Council. Uh, and that existed from uh, mid-2015 uh, mid all the way up until 2018 when the White, uh, when the White House uh, under Trump and, the, and their National Security Office disbanded it just before this thing happened. Now, I'm not saying that if we had had that office, we wouldn't have had this problem. Uh, but on the other hand, we would know a lot more about it right now if we had kept that office functioning. And that, and to me, an awful lot of the of any of these situations is the knowledge you have, the information. Uh, mm -hmm. You can collect the information and organize it. Patterns begin to form that give you guidance. Just as I, I mentioned, the 75% uh, are in the heart disease hypertension area, 75% of the people who contract the disease. But when we know those kind of things, we can start targeting policy and you can start, start making things um, uh, be much more focused. And, uh, and uh, when you do that, uh, you'll find that the complementary integrative stuff that uh, uh, that NIH office knows about does fit in um, as an adjunct, at least, to help people figure out how to have a full integrated approach to taking care of themselves. And I, and I think in our society, um, the better that each individual can take care of themselves, the better the community and the society at large can take care of themselves. Right, and obviously with something like this COVID-19 pandemic, the more people are taking care of themselves, the more we can slow the virus down. Right now it's like a wildfire kind of spreading out. I just say, a lot, you know, the ones being most hurt are people over 65 <clears throat> and people with pre-existing conditions. But I've just been doing some research on health in the United States and was shocked to discover that the majority of Americans have a serious pre-existing condition like diabetes or heart disease or cancer. Uh, so, so many of our people when this uh, COVID-19 hit were more vulnerable, more susceptible to getting it and, and having more serious consequences when they do get it. So, we definitely want to get this under control. And it, it's very concerning the, in my view, colossal mismanagement uh, at the national level by the president, uh, President Trump. Uh, and what you were talking about, dismantling this agency that President Obama had set up to prepare for a pandemic. And what would our response be as a matter of national security? And just like we had it, it was already set up and running. And he disbanded that and this pretending that he's like in La La Land that we're turning the corner and everything's fine when he knows that's just not true. So, and what we need is this, a, I think a very aggressive national plan to encourage people to do the things that matter, the things that you've talked about, you know, the um, exercise. I actually haven't heard that out there that much. But the exercising is really good. Obviously, the mask wearing and social distancing. But uh, the other thing you touched on was supplements and what they might do. We've even got, I was glad to see Dr. Fauci saying um, that he supports people if you're deficient in vitamin D, which most Americans are because we're out of the sun so much. He uh, encourages people to take vitamin D supplements and also vitamin C as a good antioxidant. So he is supporting vitamin C and vitamin D supplements. I know there's other things I've heard people talk about zinc. Um, what do you think of zinc or, or any of the other Zinc's supplements good, out there? Zinc is a very good uh, piece of the, of, of the equation that uh, would be as useful as well. Again, uh, you want to, you know, your, your own uh, personal biology is uh, important to think about. Uh, and you want to, you know, you don't want to do these things in a proper manner. You don't want to, you don't want to fill yourself up with stuff that's a waste of time and money and may, may possibly in extreme amounts cause a problem, although none of those actually uh, so shows up showing uh, much of a problem. Right. The well Go ahead. Uh, the, well, the uh, the um, notion, the, the the underlying notion of the in, uh, inherent health of the body, and 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 basically, the natural healing world 
uh, and I said there are about a hundred of these organized modalities, mm -hmm. uh, talk about the innate intelligence of the body, its ability to heal itself. And what they're doing is uh, trying to engage the actual mechanisms the body uses to heal itself or to protect itself or to uh, enhance itself. Uh, interestingly, um, uh, intervention that operates on something of the same theory is vaccination, uh, which is supposed to uh, you know, get your body to engage and become uh, create a resistance to the thing that is being injected. And then that resistance becomes something that allows you to resist whatever the thing is that's out of the event. So, so it's, it's moving in that same kind of direction. Uh, on the other side of the coin, um, there's an awful lot of um, effort to um, um, uh, manage nature uh, rationally and intellectually coming from policymakers supported by science. But science, the best of science, is only a picture of what's going on, not the totality. I like to use the uh, I like to use the metaphor of uh, it's like taking science is like a flashlight that you take in the attic, and you know you shine it around the attic, and you say you know there's a stuffed doll, there's a flag, there's an old dress, all that's true. Those are all there. You can prove it. You shine the light on it. The mistake is then when you say and there's nothing else up here, and indeed there are no other attics. Uh, that's how the intellectual process gets us away from the solid framework. Uh, so if you ground on the solid flame framework, it's interesting to watch the scientific mind work because as soon as it begins to see a pattern beginning to form, it starts looking for more pieces of that pattern and new stuff begins to emerge. That's what science is. Science is a process. Uh, now, politics, on the other hand, is having to act now. That's what it is. I mean, you got to vote. Uh, you got to pass a law, you got to, you know, send the police and, you know, enforcement of the law is actually a political act. It's part of the political structure. Mm -hmm. Now we want them to be, do, be done justly. We want them to do effectively and so forth, but they're political acts. And whenever you have to act politically, you have to do so on the basis of the information you have available. So mm -hmm. then you say you make the best decision on the information you have available. Mm -hmm. That does not make it the right decision. It means it's mm -hmm. the best decision we could make. Now, I'm very curious. One of the things that uh, strikes me as um, complicated about this vaccine problem is the marketplace is organized to run, allowing people to put things in the market that aren't necessarily the best things. But then the market sorts its way through and the ones that aren't good get rejected by the markets and the ones that are good get embraced by the markets. That's a pretty sound uh, idea if you're gonna talk about, you know, say, let's say automobiles or television sets. But when you come down to a vaccine, uh, it's what is it being, what is being said when you say we have three vaccines who are going to compete with, the, with each other? What are they competing about? Are they com competing about which one is better than the other in helping to protect? Are they talking about which one's better than the other in safety? Are they talking about which one's better than the other in delivery? Now, we're gonna sit here and put a lot of resources into using the market to sort those questions out. And one of the ways we're gonna know is when one works better than the other and we'll say the other was not the one we should have used. And then all of a sudden the people that use the other, like let's say, because we don't have all the Pfizer vaccine that we need, mm -hmm. uh, maybe we're gonna use something that's not as good as Pfizer. And then we're going to end up with our folks uh, having to sort it out by, by chance as a marketplace. That's a very complicated idea to use for something like stopping the pandemic. Now, there's, there's another point about the vaccine issue uh, that we need to think about. So I'm, I'm saying we're, you know, we're using a competitive marketplace to figure out what the right vaccine is. So all the FDA is saying is that it's safe and we think it works. And uh, this is safe, we think it works. This is safe, we think it's works. But none of them are saying this is, it, it, I mean, it would be like having set up three Manhattan projects to see which one made the best atom bomb. I mean, that's not the way you wanna make public policy. Now let's, let's turn around and go in another direction and say, um, uh, we, one of the things that's uh, looked at as being very effective was eliminating smallpox. Uh, mm -hmm. What's interesting about eliminating smallpox is that vaccines were used in a very, very specific way. They were targeted. They did not go out and vaccinate huge swaths of the population. 
what they did was crack the disease. They did many, many things to get it under control. And then where they had pockets, they would vaccinate around it to block, keep it from breaking out of the pockets. But they didn't vaccinate the entire population for smallpox uh, in, the, in the eradication program that went on after the Second World War. And uh, I, I smallpox was declared eradicated sometime, I think, in the 80s. Uh, and uh, that was done with a targeted vaccine strategy. And we don't have any place right now that I can see where that idea can be evaluated along with, part, with vaccinating 100% of the population. And I don't see where we're sorting out the criteria of which people should be vaccinated prior to other people, other than using things such as people in nursing homes and people who are working in hospitals. And those are two of the biggest places that the vaccine breaks out of. Um, you know, and that, you know, in the, in, in, the, in the long run, that may be the right decision, but the process for getting there has left a lot of other things not considered that might have been considered. Yeah, well, I think they were kind of in a panic and in a rush. And those two, when I heard that that's what the CDC was recommending as the first two groups to that's get it, they, that's 65 and over and the healthcare workers, that made perfect sense to me. It was, it was not only 65 and over, but in nursing homes. Oh, is that right? In nursing homes, okay. The, the problem yeah. is that they're that they're um, they're breeders, they're breeder centers. Uh, you know, so people who are pushed together in a population who have underlying health disease and are over six, oh, in those cases maybe over over seventy five. You push that all together, and you have a high breeding uh, 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 environment for the for the virus. Yeah, and and I'm really hoping that the FDA does a good job because if they start targeting those populations with the first rollout of the vaccines, and there's a serious problem with the vaccines, the seniors in nursing homes are not going to be as strong as other people to be able well, to and, fight back. And also, that's also true of the healthcare workers. I mean, right. it's a very we, we serious want problem if you, uh, if you suddenly had a, some kind, suppose that 10% suppose that of the healthcare workers are uh, highly uh, uh, allergic uh, and don't know it, and you go through there and give them the vaccine, and they're uh, and they're and they're taken offline. They can't work. Right. We're already so short of people, and we lose another ten percent. That could be a serious problem. And I, all I'm saying is that I mean, my my point is that if you've had a a a coherent, centered place where these kinds of things could be considered rationally and systematically, you would be a, a, a farther ahead than we are now. They did a apparently they did a um, a um, uh, a war game type activity on uh, a, uh, a virus attack, virus uh, outbreak uh, late last year, late in uh, 2019, and had pretty much laid out all the dynamics of what would happen. And then the results of that never really got engaged in working out where we were going, uh, largely because of the sort of, uh, well, the, 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 the surprise of having it hit as it did uh, for the policymakers. And then the policymakers being kind of uh, all over the place and how they were dealing with it. Uh, so that right. Well, and Trump that. set up multiple groups to be working on Different a vaccine, parties. the, yeah. the whole parties. pandemic response. So they were, it was never really well thought through. Um, but I thought we had a place to consider this nationally. Isn't that what the Centers for Disease Control is supposed to be well, doing? Well, the, the Center for Disease Control is a, an interesting uh, entity. Uh, first of all, they've been trying to articulate a rational policy and not been, not being able to break through a lot of the decision making. Um, secondly, uh, they're a they're a um, an interesting institution in that uh, a vast amount of what they do is make recommendations. Mm -hmm. They don't they don't they don't give orders, they don't manage, they don't cause things to happen, they make recommendations. So for example, the whole vaccination program is a state-run program. Mm -hmm. um, now on COVID, I don't know exactly how they've worked that out because there are lots of agreements made between the federal government and the state governments. But what the, um, what the way they were talking about it today when they were getting ready to approve it at FDA was that um, the, uh, they cleared it with all the states and they were going to go and pick up all the vaccine doses. They're, they're, um, I think they, they said uh, they've got uh, doses enough for 20,000 people. Mm -hmm. uh, they're picking them all up at the manufacturing plant in Indiana. As I said, putting on, uh, uh, taking, taking them in directly to the hubs for uh, UPS and FedEx. FedEx is doing west of the Mississippi, 
UPS is doing east of the Mississippi. Uh, and that's all being done down, uh, actually they're going through, it, it, and now that, you, now that I think about it, they're going through veterans hospitals. So they're using the federal distribution system. But again, it's not CDC doing it. The CDC is setting up uh, ideas or ex explanations. Fauci works at NIH. He has no actual line authority for what he's doing. He's basically an advisor. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and they're taking this stuff out through the Veterans Administration, through Veterans Hospitals. So that's all, that's all pretty interesting. So. Yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, so the FDA today is, um, you know, doing its deliberation. How much confidence do you have in the FDA? I mean, I think so many people, their confidence has been shaken by what's gone on over the past 10 or 20 years. Do you have confidence when the FDA says this is safe, that it's really safe? Well, uh, I, uh, I uh, long ago um, uh, concluded that the FDA actually uh, makes a decision, which is, is it safe enough? Uh, if you draw a line and say, on this side, it's safe, on this side, it's unsafe, you're going to be wrong every time. Every time you're going to be wrong because nothing, no set, vaccines, any drug, no set divides into all those things that are only good and all those things that are only bad. Mm -hmm. uh, there's just what they call the big gray area. And in that area, there are some things that are deadly to some people and essential to the well being of other people. I, I mentioned the opioids earlier. Opioids are very important to a number of people who are uh, in extremis from pain. Uh, now we say there's a suicide, uh, there's a suicide epidemic from opioids. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the suicides are because people don't have opioids. Uh, that, and all I'm saying is that mm -hmm. they don't divide that easily. Mm -hmm. So I have confidence that the, um, the advisory committees will make a shot at saying this is safe enough. Uh, and that I, I'm, I, I, I would be very, if a, if a committee at the FDA said this is not safe enough, I would buy that uh, in uh, a minute. If a, you if would. A, so you don't think the FDA is like a puppet of the corporation? If it's not, I said, if it's not safe. Uh, oh, if it's not if safe. It's not safe. Okay. Now, um, there's that whole gray area, and then there's the whole it's safe area. And I think that where I'd, ha I'd have to see where they draw the line. Um, um, in, a, in a case like this, I think they're going to give a much more leeway to let it come through than in a state mm -hmm. in a case where uh, what you were doing was, uh, you know, approving a, uh, a, a prescription headache medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, they must be more rigorous. Now, I do know that on many, a number, a significant number of occasions, which are troubling, the FDA overturns its advisory committees. Uh, there's no doubt that the advisory committees are political entities as well as scientific entities. They do, they are influenced by political questions. And you have to understand uh, who gets the vaccine is a political question uh, and uh, not a science question. It's a political question. Now, you can put science as a part of making that decision. And that interaction is very important. Now, would I uh, rely on the FDA uh, to tell me that if something's safe, I would then say, yes, great. I would not. Uh, mm. The reason for that is I said in the past, 50% uh, of what's gone through the FDA process as a, a new use for a drug uh, or a new drug even has been withdrawn. I mean, some of the, you know, a couple of billion, multi-billion dollar drugs have been withdrawn by FDA after years of use. Uh, and frank, frankly, I wasn't sure that was the right, the right policy decision because a lot of people were using some of these drugs that were uh, taken off the market effectively. Mm -hmm. And it was important to them, uh, particularly some of the uh, prescription painkillers, very important to them. And taking those away might have fed into the opioid crisis. So mm -hmm. I'm not saying that they took it away and that was a good thing, but I am saying that allowing it to be out there and have people buy it and use it that shouldn't have was a bad thing. So I'm saying it's very unclear as to whether you would give the FDA a yes or no on any given decision. In this case, uh, if they said, don't market it, I would go with that in a minute. If they said, go ahead and let it be in the market, I would say, all right, now let's watch it really, really, really carefully. Particularly mm -hmm. since I saw the former commissioner of the FDA saying, we're gonna know how well this drug works after it's released and we do the post-marketing research. Right. Um, I mean, yeah, that's we're a, all the guinea pigs. Well, you know, and, and if, we, if we had a better policy, we might have better guinea pigs. Yeah. Well, you know, and that's a great assessment, I think, of the FDA. Uh, 
And we know the companies all have different track records. We had you know, Purdue Pharma was just the predatory one with pushing the opioids run by the Sackler and owned by the Sackler family. So they have kind of been pushed out of business now, thankfully. But uh, where does Pfizer stand in the ladder of corporate social responsibility? Are they a reliable company or are they? Well, they're considered, they're considered to be one of the gold standard companies. Gold yeah. standard. So, so they're, they're one of the more reliable pharmaceutical companies. Well, they're, they, they meet, uh, you know, they're, 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 they're a solid company in that regard. Now, I, I do want to say one other thing about COVID. Uh, I think all of our uh, complicated, uh, complex systems, mostly post-Second World War systems, are all under heavy strain right now. Education, uh, education, health, uh, 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 all of the energy systems, um, uh, all of them are under enormous pressure. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a way in which COVID's outbreak uh, is actually sort of bringing under the microscope all of these systems. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at the education system. I mean, the problems that are showing up in the education system because of COVID are problems that have been there all along and have been identified. I mean, back in, the, I think, was it 1989? Uh, um, the education department put out a study that uh, with an advisory group saying our education system was collapsing essentially. Uh, criminal justice has been very thoroughly looked at. Uh, our food system is a, a, a food supply system has got an enormous number of problems in it. Uh, and all of that is being pushed by COVID. And there is a way in which this COVID period, this thing that's happening uh, is a breakout. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's the people saying, look, enough of all of this bad stuff going on in these institutions, we've got to get them fixed up. In that framework, Pfizer uh, is a very good one of the established systems, but the entire established structure has got uh, strains on it to produce what needs to be uh, made viable for the public. Uh, they've been way too narrow and functioning around this uh, very narrow draw line, good, bad process. And that process has led us down a lot of bad tracks, uh, including leading us to having to say the only answer or the, the, the definite primary answer is the, the, the vaccine. Uh, we're not going to win this just with the vaccine. There's a whole lot of other stuff that's got to go on as well. Right. So uh, kind of what I'm hearing is a big yes to the things we can do naturally to strengthen our bodies, which is the exercise, eating healthy foods, and, um, you know, vitamin C, vitamin D, and maybe some of the other modalities you mentioned, and kind of a maybe to the vaccine, but yes, it's probably a good idea to do a vaccine if we're convinced it's right for us, and that one is safe, and it fits with our own that each of us needs to make that decision individually. Is that the right takeaway? Yeah, uh, yeah. I would put uh, what I would say is that there's a whole mosaic of health interventions of which vaccines are one. All of those need to be available for the public to choose. And if the public, uh, the more the public chooses um, better health through uh, exercise, nutrition. Uh, and all of the things that have been, been presented to us over the last uh, 20, 30 years as the things we should be doing, the more those things get pushed out there, the less we're going to have to be reliant on the vaccine. And that's not necessarily saying you don't get the vaccine. It just means that we have put all our eggs in that vaccine basket, and it's not necessarily going to work to solve the entire problem. And where can our listeners learn more about these other health interventions? I know you've got your website well, at Citizens Health. Well, we're, health. Going, we're trying, we, our plan, and we've been doing a little bit of it, is, is, is creating a space on Citizens for Health, citizens.org, to put things there. But people have to just keep going back and looking at them. And, uh, and uh, we've got one uh, out this week on the uh, compensation system. Uh, the COVID compensation system has been altered so that... Uh, um, many things that would have been paid for by the government. The government's paid over $4 billion to people who have been injured by vaccines uh, under the current program, the program that has been around until 2010. Under the 2010 and later program, the uh, number of people who get compensated is far, far, far less. And so we have an article talking about that. Uh, it's troubling because it means that somewhere in the establishment, the, the idea was made that there's going to be a lot more side effects Right, can, but is there a website that says here's the hundred modalities or what else would you uh, recommend? We, we, uh, we don't have that yet. We'll put it, uh, I'll try to put, well, I'll, I'll tell our folks, get that up there and, and you can go there and look at it. 
And I'll awesome. Fantastic. Well, uh, that's all the time we have. Uh, Jim Turner, thank you so much for being here and for sharing your wisdom and knowledge with us. Really appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. And it's a good topic to be focused on. Dr. Cheryl Selman, and welcome to What Women Must Know. Thank you for joining me for another episode of really empowering conversations that will support you in your health and well-being and allow you to make informed decisions. And that really is what the show is all about, is to give you more knowledge, more insight, more of an ability to make the choices that support you. No one actually can really tell anyone else what to do, but if we had the knowledge, if we have the information, the most accurate, truthful information, then...